Hello, everyone, and welcome to the PhD defense of Mathieu Jacomi, who has uh, handed in his thesis. It's been positively evaluated by the Board of Assessors, who in a minute will read the conclusion of their assessment. We are here today for three hours to conduct the formal assessment of the PhD. Uh, it will begin uh, with Mathieu presenting his work for 45 minutes. Then we have a slight change of program. We will not have a break after Mathieu has presented. We will go straight to Bernhard Rieder, who is a professor of New Media and Culture at the University of Amsterdam and part of the assessment board, who will give his half hours of questions. Then we will have a break for 15 minutes. And then Brit, who is professor at the IT University and the head of the Center for Digital Welfare, will give her 30 minutes of questions. And then finally, Torben, who is the head of the assessment board, will have 30 minutes. Torben is also a professor here at the uh, Techno-Anthropology Research Group. Um, and all you guys out there who are participating virtually, you will have an opportunity to ask questions if you send me an email, and then I will ask your question in here in the last Q&A segment um, on your behalf. My email is, is in the, uh, the program you've been sent along with your Zoom link. So um, if you feel like asking a question along the way, send that email to me and I'll see if I can make room for it in the last segment. And then eventually we'll conclude with the, the assessment board evaluating and returning with a verdict in the end. And before I give the, the word, uh, the floor to Mathieu, uh, I just want to uh, let Torben, who has been head of the committee, give you the conclusion uh, of the committee. Thank you very much, Anas, and thank you, Mathieu, for all the work you have put into this and uh, the, and hence generated this occasion for us today. Um, so I will just read uh, the, the few concluding lines from the, from, uh, the assessment committee's uh, preliminary assessment. I'll read the few concluding lines from the preliminary assessment of the, the thesis. Uh, the final assessment will happen uh, after we have uh, concluded the event today. Um, but just to, to set the tone, so to speak, I will, I will read out what we wrote. So, so we're writing or concluding here. In general, the text and its argument is very clear and convincing. It is full of well-chosen distinctions, metaphors, visualizations, experiments, and comparisons. It builds on and incorporates already important and highly impactful work on digital methods, and it enriches this work by adding a new level of reflection, as well as strategically chosen attempts to tinker with the practice of visual network analysis. All in all, the text is an impressive, theoretical, technical, and empirical examination of visual network analysis that adds considerable new knowledge to the field and that develops an original set of theoretical and methodological tools that will undoubtedly have an impact on future discussions. So on that note, I will um, pass on to you. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. So uh, welcome and uh, hi, everyone. Um, I, I'm presenting my thesis, and it's called Situating Visual Network Analysis. And I'm an instrumentalist, so I'm a tool maker. I, I used to, I'm trained as an engineer, I used to work as an engineer, and I'm now reflecting in, on my practice and the practice of people who have used the tools I have contributed to, to make, to become a, a scholar in techno-anthropology, I guess. And this is the plan for today. After a short intro, I'm going to explain the two terms of uh, of the title, starting with visual network analysis, VNA, and then looking at what situating means, and then I will show a few situating moves, and I'm going to explain what it is when I get to situatingness, and I will shortly conclude. This is the state of affairs when I started the PhD. Two papers that have uh, co-authored with uh, Mathieu Bastien and Sebastien Eman, and for the second one also with Tommaso Venturini. The, the left one is the proxy paper of Giffy. 
It's a tool I have contributed to create that does network visualization and analysis. And it was awarded the Test of Time Award at the ICWSM conference in 2019 because it was the most cited paper of 10 years ago. People cite it instead of the tool. The, the paper itself is not super interesting. And this is just to say that the, that tool has had some uh, success. And on the right, you have a contribution to the algorithms embedded in the tool. Um, it's the, the algorithm for Statless 2 that is described is a layout algorithm. Its job is to place the nodes in the space. But let's talk about what a network is first. Maybe everyone knows that, but at least let's start with the basics. So a network is made of nodes and edges or links. They may represent many different things, people and their relations, um, papers citing each other, or ecosystems. Often they are represented with dots and lines like you see on the right. I will also make use of the term uh, network map uh, to talk about the visualizations like the one you see on the left. These two networks are the same, but as you can see, there is some semiotic work that has been put into the visualization on the left, which is not just about placing the nodes in space. And well, I know it's not really a map, but for convenience, I'm still going to stick with the word network map. The typical network map you will see is often kind of like this one, which comes from Divided Day blog, a famous paper by Adamic and Glenn's that is kind of a common thread in the manuscript. And so I'm going to explain how you're supposed to read that. This comes from a study of the blogosphere of the US um, web just before uh, the political elections, the presidential elections in 2004, where George W. Bush would be re-elected. And the, so the rounds you see, the, the circles are the blogs, the arrows or the lines are the, the, the hyperlinks between the blogs. In, it's in a time where uh, Facebook and Twitter are not as dominant as today, so people write blogs. And the color comes from a manual tagging of these blogs, these nodes, by Adamic and Glantz. They have put in blue the Democrats and in red the Republicans. And what's interesting here is that there is roughly speaking a, a correspondence between the color and the position of the nodes. So let's talk about the position of the nodes. The nodes have been placed with an algorithm that is of the same family as Force Atlas II, old, an older one, and the position reflects the links. So the position ignores the color and the color ignores the position. So it's remarkable, therefore, that the two match. We have a packet on the left, a cluster on the left, a cluster on the right, and one seems to be blue and the other one seems to be red. If you look closely, you'll see that it's not an absolute rule. There are a few blue among the, the red and vice versa, but still there is a correspondence. And so this tells us that um, the Democrat blogs tend to cite more Democrat blogs and the Republican blogs tend to, send, to cite more uh, Republican blogs. It's kind of a typical example because often what you want to see in a network map is clusters. Anyways, this image was really famous and it inspired us um, to use network visualization to study the web of migrants. And we created with Dana Adminesco uh, the eDiaspora Atlas project where we mapped um, multiple diasporas on the web with a network of researchers. And that's the project where Giphy was born. I just want to acknowledge before I move, I move on that there are other ways to understand the word network. Network might be um, a metaphor to describe collective phenomena, or some people might use, might use it as the, the name of the phenomenon itself. It might be just data. It might be just an apparatus, to, a methodological apparatus to, to deal with that data. And I'm not uh, saying that it's wrong to call uh, network the phenomenon. Of course, I don't pretend that the relation of a mother to a daughter can be reduced to a line in a family tree. But here I'm going to use the word network to talk about data and implicitly the methods that go with it and the techniques. But that's, that's not a statement, that's just uh, how it is. We've included, the, we have co-written the, the, this paper with Anna Smunk and Tommaso Venturini, which engages with the different meanings in uh, in STS of the word network and the confusion they cause. So here for me, network is 
data and method. And there are also three main fields that are concerned with networks, network science, social network analysis and, and network analysis. I'm not going to develop that here uh, because I don't have the time, but I want to mention that another paper in the thesis is a controversy mapping around the notion of scale freeness in the field of network science. Scale freeness is tied to the idea of complex networks. And I show that even in this field, not everyone agrees on what a complex network is in this case. Okay. So, what is visual network analysis? Well, it's a part of data science, and more precisely, data analysis. Now, when you analyze data, depending on the kind of data you have, you may uh, use one set of methods or another. If you have images, you have, you, you have certain needs. And then if you have relational data, you're going to go for network analysis. And relational data is, for me, whatever contains entities and relations explicitly or sometimes implicitly. Now, if you go for visual methods, I'm just going to code that visual network analysis. It's nothing more complicated than that. But I don't mean that you have to visualize. You, you do not have to. You can perfectly analyze networks without visualizing them. And then, for instance, you can use statistical metrics. And of course, you will, when you visualize them, you're not only going to visualize them. You will also often use metrics like centrality metrics. So in the thesis, there is a paper we have co-authored with Martin Grandjean, where not only we show the different visualizations that we can find in the digital humanities, but also we try to set a correspondence between the visual patterns we may find in, in visual network analysis and the, the, the centrality metrics or other metrics that you can use to analyze networks. I also want to mention that when you go visual, you do not have to use these dot line um, strategies that I, I have shown so much. You can use matrices, for instance. Then the nodes are going to be the, the rows and the columns, and the edges are going to be the dots of the matrix. And even if you go for dot line diagrams, you do not have to place the nodes with a force directed layout algorithm. For instance, here you have a, a hive plot where the nodes are placed using attributes. But what I'm going to focus here is mostly uh, the network maps, so where the nodes have been placed with force driven layout algorithms or something of the same family, roughly speaking, uh, dimensionality reduction. So visual network analysis is first and foremost a practice. Here's a photo I took from the walls of Dana Dimineskos office uh, after the end of the e-diaspora atlas project. And she had uh, put on the walls the different visualizations we had printed to use as a support to discuss with the researchers involved in the project. As you can see, they have been annotated, combined. They have served as a support for a discussion, a reflection, so that we can build an interpretation of the networks. And firstly, it's never been done all alone in isolation. It's always been combined with other ways of inquiring into the data, like just field work, for instance. But also, it doesn't mean that these visualizations have made it through the end of the paper, for instance. So I have the, an example of one of the outcomes of the project that circulates in, in the room. For those who want to check that, online you can't. But there is a website. It's e-diaspora.fr, I think. You're going to find it easily. Um, so the outcomes are these networks, but also papers. And sometimes the networks are not in the final papers because they have been used to, to get some knowledge for the team but the visualization itself was not really productive in the final paper, just a, a figure might be or something else. Another kind of finding text, for instance, simply. And that's, that's not a big deal because networks have been used as, as an elicitation device, if you want. There's an example of that in other, one of the papers of the thesis, which is a visual network exploration for data journalists that we have co-authors with uh, Thomas Venturini, uh, Jonathan Gray, and Liana Bunegru, where we do a, a, a visual analysis uh, in, the, in, the, in the field of data journalism. And we do use these network maps for ourselves to understand um, the structure of the network. And we expose this method in the paper, because that's the point of the paper. But in the end, 
the best visualizations to communicate the, the findings to an audience might be things like the one you see on the left, on the top left, which are somehow networks, but as you can see, they've been highly curated to convey a more clear message. So we would call those explanatory visualizations as opposed to exploratory visualizations in the case of these network maps. No, that's what we do. That doesn't mean that everyone has to do that and everyone does not necessarily do that. But I'll come back to that. So what does situating mean? It's a term I take from Donna Haraway, from her famous uh, 1988 paper, Situated Knowledges. And she writes, the only way to find a larger vision is to be somewhere in particular. Only partial perspective promises objective vision. So it's a theory of objectivity um, where she finds another version of objectivity than what she calls the gut trick of seeing everything from nowhere where basically knowledges are warranted by the fact of being true. So when they are warranted by the fact of being true, um, they do not need to be um, situated. The circumstances that have served to build them do not have to be present anymore because being true suffices. And of course, as a, a feminist STS scholar, she, she wants to propose another version of objectivity that allows us always uh, re-examining our relation to knowledge. And this is, has been used, so I'm not the one who drew Haraway into this story. It comes from a criticism from, for instance, uh, Evelyn Rupert and Stefan Schill, and they write in their paper on the politics of methods and, and big data that the map's capacity to build a lies derives precisely from making absent all the work that goes into the map's crafting. So I take these critics seriously. They do cite Haraway, of course. And I wonder first, so is there something in the network maps that are done with GFE, for instance, on that circulate that makes them unsituated? And by that, I mean situatedness, the circumstances where they have been produced. Has it been lost somehow? And how can it be lost? So that's basically my entry point for the rest of my presentation. I'm going to showcase what I call situating move. And the simplest way to take it is to see situatedness as something that is lost. And I want to show how it can be lost, assuming that it was there in the first place. Now, the situation is not something you can assume was there. Because Haraway, what she wants and what she, what she demands is that we are always re able to re-examine our relation. That's why the circumstances must be visible. And it's an open-ended question. We may change, our uh, perspective may change. Who decides what the situation is? So the way I'm going to tackle that is look at narratives that exist in the literature and that tell what makes a difference to the produced knowledge. And I'm going to challenge these narratives. I'm going to show that there are other narratives that are not known and that there are other things that make a difference and other differences that can be made. So that's the axis. Uh, of the, the second of the next part. And finally, I'm going to try to intervene or interfere with um, the practices with networks. And I say caring because I'm not going to be um, normative here. I'm just trying to make some things visible. But I'll explain when I, when I get there. OK, so first, the situatedness of network maps as something that gets lost somewhere. I want to start with this paper we have co-authored with Emilia Jokoboskaite. It's included in the thesis. We study the practices with Gephi. And we narrate an anecdote that happened to me in a PhD seminar at uh, British University where Evelyn Rupert was invited and uh, next to Evelyn Rupert's talk there was a kind of a side event with PhD students presenting their work. And one of the students, I didn't know her, she didn't know me, she presented some slides. And in one of the slides, there was a Giphy screenshot, and she said, uh, we also do these fancy visualizations. And then she moved on. And 
So my first reaction was to think that maybe she doesn't like that. She thinks it's not interesting or not relevant, which is perfectly fine by itself. But then I wonder, why would she put that in the slides then? So my hypothesis here is that on the one hand, she could not really explain easily what it's about, but she still wanted to use it. So the reason why she wanted to use it is not tied to understanding what's in there. That's where I come from this, with this idea of story letting, which is letting the story, letting the image tell its own story. So my, my hypothesis here, and that's something I have also observed in other places, is that these images, they exist. They were born in a different context, an exploratory context, for instance, where they were produced for yourself or for close collaborators who had uh, the, the, the knowledge necessary to understand them because they had been engaged with the data. But of course, it doesn't mean that these images can be understood by someone else, right? And I think that they have been repurposed as communication assets because, you know, when you, when you make your slides, maybe you browse what the material you have and you take what's interesting. And of course, this image may tell Various things in tell, my data is quantitative, my data is complex, I master these digital tools. And then, so you use this image, but you can't really explain it because it would be maybe too complicated. So you say nothing. And here the situating move from my side is to naming that because it's not a non-act of doing that. Not do giving the context is not a non-act, it's an act. And when you do that, well, you contribute to the, the disappearance, the loss of situatedness because you suggest that uh, the image doesn't need any context, maybe that it is self-evident in some ways. And anyways, you do not give any information. So how would people understand what it means and how it can be read? So story letting. And I come also with um, another concept that I want to explain. That is the noema of big data visualization. Noema is a phenomenological concept that uh, I take from Roland Barthes, who uses it to explain photography. You, you can understand it as essence. I'm not going to go into explaining what the noema is. So for Roland Barthes, the noema, the essence of photography was that has been. And I want to come with something similar for these visualizations, um, because I think that the image itself makes a difference. I'll come back to that. But first, what do I call a big data visualization? So it's a visualization where first you have too many signs that you can believe that these signs have been put there for you to understand each of them. There are clearly too many bars here in this picture, in this, in this image. You are not supposed to read each and every one of them. So a proliferation of signs and then an emergent pattern. So what do I call an emergent pattern? Because everything you see in some sense is a pattern. But some of the things you can see by looking at this image are clearly construction rules. For instance, this bar, they are, have a, a square section. And all of them have a square section, so this is a construction rule. Now, other things you may observe are clearly not construction rules. For instance, there are white and known red bars, and what might explain that? Maybe the small bars are red and the tall bars are white, but if you look closely, it's not the case. You have small white bars and you, you have moderately high red bars. So, but still it seems that white bars tend to be bigger. And you can also see that there is an accumulation of white bars in certain places. And if you recognize uh, Denmark, you will also recognize that they accumulate in, in the big cities of Denmark. Okay, what does that mean? So from there, you may go into the visualization uh, look at the detail, look at the text, look at the title, and get more information and inquire into the image. But I don't want to follow this inquiry because I think that what's important here is that the inquiry was triggered in the first place. It was triggered because there is something that is clearly, or that appears to be, um, put there unwillingly, unintentionally because it's not a message that was put there to be conveyed to you, but you, stand, you can still see that it's there. So is it really here? Is, it looking, is, this, is this a population map, for instance? Well, the thing is, for that to know that if it's true, if it's biased or whatever, you have to actually do the inquiry into the meaning of the image. But you don't have to if the point is just to realize that there is something in there to be found. So that's why I call 
that the noema of big data visualization, there is an order to that chaos. That means that if the point you want to make is there is hidden knowledge in the data that can be extracted in some ways, which is a classic rhetoric of big data, then the image itself is making that point. And it, the point I want to make here, by contrast with uh, Evelyn Rupert and Stefan Schilling in their paper on the politics of methods, where they put most of the weight into other things but not the image, I want to say that the image itself has this power. So the image makes a difference. And of course, that's important to me because network map qualify as big data visualizations. So they also have this intrinsic ability to suggest that there is something hidden in there. Now, is it really there? Well, that's a completely different question. OK. So who decides what the situation is? First, I want to talk about who tells what a good network visualization is. And by that, I mean, maybe if you look at the academic literature, what will you find? Um, so people draw networks since a very long time. At least in the 30s, we have Moreno sociograms and they in the field of social network analysis. Um, there is a practice of uh, visualizing networks. But no one wrote papers based on that practice to try evaluating what's a good graph drawing before the 80s, where um, people like Sugiyama and his colleagues interviewed and observed engineers who drew diagrams in, in their jobs and to find what they, these experts think a good diagram is. And from that and from the, the help of other people like Peter Eads, uh, Di Battista, Tamasia, they stabilized a series of what they called aesthetic criteria that you can read here on, on the list on the right. Things such as um, the edges should not bend, they should not cross or as, as, as much as possible. Um, if there is a symmetry, the, the, the layout should reflect the symmetry, the edges should, should be as short as possible, as homogeneous as possible. There are more, I'm not going to list all of them. And some of them have been also proved experimentally that they, they, they have an influence on readability. For instance, edge crossings is widely seen as a, as a problem for uh, network readability. Now let's jump to uh, the contemporary era, which in fact starts in, in the 2000s. So this is um, a paper by Andreas Noack, which is Consider, so it's a paper about an algorithm, a layout algorithm, like for Atlas 2, actually um, older and considered the gold standard. So it's kind of the best algorithm. And <clears throat> as you can see first, the kind of net network you see here is completely different. It's much bigger. Um, NOAC does, doesn't even display the edges. And if you had the edges, you would see that they are so entangled that it's, it's completely different from the kind of small and easy to read diagrams we had in the 80s and in the 90s. This is networks, for instance, from the web, and they started to arrive to us in, in the, the end of the 90s and early 2000s. And what he has to say about what he tries to achieve with his algorithm is that his goal is to provide separability of the groups that are in the network. And he says that to do that, you have to violate the aesthetic criteria. So these aesthetic criteria that, that were stabilized earlier, they used to be making a difference in the right sense, they helped readability, and now they make a difference in the bad sense, they are problem to readability. Now, what's really weird is that they correspond to two different understanding of what the network is and what, how we should read it, and nevertheless, the dominant narrative that you will still find today in the literature is the old one, and it has not been replaced by another narrative. So we try to clarify that in the paper with uh, Tomaso Ventrini and Pablo Jensen, which is in the thesis. It's just published in Big Data and Society, where we propose two distinct interpretation regimes of networks that should not be confused. The diagrammatic one, that's the old one, it works for small networks. The tasks you want to achieve are finding certain nodes, 
uh, following the path. And basically, readability is about legibility. If you can see it, you can interpret it. Well, what we have to do now is completely different because our networks are much bigger. They are also much more entangled because some of the nodes are, are hyper-connected. By that, I mean they have so many edges that we can't even expect following the path. And instead, what we, we hope to read is what the groups are, what the clusters are. So we expect to see the topology of the network through the placement of the nodes, which is a completely different endeavor. So the practices have shifted around the 2000s. I, I, I remind that Divided Day blog is 2005, so it's, it's basically 20 years old now. And the practices have always paved the way and the, the papers have always been behind. So if you just read the literature, it might not be clear to you what actually makes a difference in the way the network map has been produced and, and what matters, basically. Now I want to also show that something else unexpected, unexpected makes a difference to the knowledge of network maps, and it's our own uh, cognitive system. I will draw on the Gestalt theory, which is a theory of how our cognition makes sense of the world as a whole. Uh, it's very use, useful, um, sorry, it's very efficient at explaining uh, illusions, like visual illusions, but it's not only visual, by the way, like the one you see on the top right. So what I'm interested in here, interested in here, is um, clouds of dots, of course, because it's, it's basically what uh, networks are, network maps. So it says, Gestalt theory, that one of the things that makes you see a cloud of dots as one thing or multiple things is you could, you could think of it as a, the silhouette, but basically it's the proximities between the dots or whatever signs there are. So if you have gaps, you will see that as multiple things, and if there are no gaps, your visual system will see it as a whole. And this is completely effortless. You don't have to think of it. It just happens. That's how your brain processes uh, the world uh, all the time. And that, weirdly, matters because it's not a line not perfectly aligned with the way the algorithm thinks of uh, proximities. So the algorithms think of pro proximities more in a prob probabilistic way where basically the average of the cloud of dots are more important than the borders, basically. So it looks from average to average. So if all the groups of dots are well separated, we will agree with the, the algorithm, like on the left. If they are completely overlapping, we will also agree. But there is a situation where the groups are separated, but because they also take space, they, there are no gaps between them. And in that case, we do not see multiple groups. And yet, the algorithm believes, thinks that the, there is a difference. There is a separability that has been enforced because there is a measurable difference uh, between the groups. So I'm not saying that the algorithm is right and we are wrong or vice versa. It's just that we are not aligned. But if you don't know that, you might just believe that seeing is believing, right? So if, if you don't see groups, there are no groups. And if you see groups, there are groups. And also, this is reinforced by the fact that most of the time it works. But that's, in fact, not the case. And you should better know that. So example here, this is a network, a classic network. It's the neural network of a nematode named C. elegans. It comes from a famous paper of Watson Strogatz on small world networks. I have used the linlog to place the nodes, and I have hidden the edges. And I bet that, like me, you don't see groups in there, or maybe a few small groups on the top. But basically, this doesn't look like multiple clusters. It, it doesn't look like divided day blog. Now, if you do some community detection, and that, uh, that kind of magic looks at the edges, it completely ignores the, the placement. It's just based on the topology of the network. It's going to find some groups. And you can also see that these groups do agree with the placement to some extent, because the red dots and the blue dots are not mixed up. They are in different areas. That's how you see that there is an agreement between finding groups 
from the topology and the visualization. And actually, if you learn how to speak the language of the algorithm, you may have other clues that tell you that groups might be here because these groups do pull the fabric of the network in different directions and then they will produce elongations uh, that you can learn to detect. So you can maybe understand that in some ways there would be gaps, but because there are nodes that are kind of in between, we don't see the gaps. But we can very well, if we think of it, understand that the presence of, or the absence of these middle nodes should not make such a difference to the existence of groups uh, in, the, in the picture. If you run the community detection algorithm multiple times, because it's not deterministic, you'll see that it hesitates for the nodes that are in the middle. It may not even find the same number of groups. But the nodes that are on the sides, they are consistently put in the same group. So the purple one are always in that group. The red ones on the left are always in that group. So there are groups in some sense because the algorithm um, for certain aspects is very consistent, but for other aspects, it's not consistent. So in some way, we might say that um, the, the groups are, uh, if the groups exist, they do not exist with the same degree of reality everywhere. Somewhere they exist in a kind of ambiguous mixed state, and in some places they actually exist quite firmly. Uh, I can engage with that more if you want and come back to that. I develop more in the thesis, but I decided to not go that way here. My point here is mainly that it's also because of our cognitive system that we see that this way. And it's useful to know it because it's part of the situation where these knowledges were produced. Yet another thing which is linked to that one. So what produces separate groups? Because one classic way to explain what these layout algorithms do is to just look at how they work. And the classic narrative here will be, because the algorithm works by pulling the nodes that are connected together and having all the, the other nodes repel each other, then of course that's why you see the groups. The separability is ensured by the act of putting connected nodes closer. And I think that this is very convincing, but it's wrong. And here is how you can see that. You have basically a simplified version of the divided day blog network, two assortative groups loosely linked. Now, these links that are in the middle that I call bridges here, they have to be long. If they were short, these two groups would be next to each other. We would see no gaps and we would see all of that as a whole. So to ensure a good separability, the, the criterion of Andreas Noack, you have to sacrifice certain edges so that they are long. Which is why Noack says that some aesthetic criteria such as having short edges or having homogeneous edge length fight against separability. So this simple and convincing narrative is wrong. Okay, so what's, what's Noack's narrative as for what is the cause of a good separability? He has a very compelling ar argument. The argument is the following. I'm just going to outline it. So each of these force-driven algorithms, they are based on uh, an attraction force that you can see here on the x-axis and the repulsion force that is on the y-axis. The repulsion force has to be negative. That's why it bounces downward. And the attraction force has to dominate the repulsion force, else everything explodes to the infinity, right? It has to converge. So depending on the repulsion force, the attraction force has to, be, has to be bigger. And that's why there is kind of a... So this is the space where you can put the energy models, as he calls that, of different layout strategies, right? So they compete and they try to be in different places. So what I mean here is that uh, Noack reflects on which kind of combination of attraction or repulsion you should use if you want to ensure separability. And he makes observations on the interplay of attraction and repulsion. And he observed that the, the stronger the attraction and the repulsion, the less the distances depend on the densities. So on what we want it is to have the distances depend the most possible on the densities because they are supposed to reflect them. So this means you must go the most possible in this direction in the diagram, and basically you're stuck in this line. And then he has a secondary criterion, which is a tiebreaker, the, the dependency on path length. And then you, re you reach the, the absolutely optimal 
energy model that you can find to ensure separability. It's a linear logarithmic energy model, hence the name DINLOG. And he says, we can't do better. And we've not done better. Case closed. OK, here's the catch. And here I'm using pictures from the paper itself. I'm not cherry picking something else. There is another ingredient in this algorithm, which is that every energy model may come in two different flavors. One is node repulsion, and the other one is edge repulsion. It depends on what you apply the repulsion. Now, if you look at the, uh, the layout on the middle, it's three times the same network with different algorithms. The one in the middle has the good energy model, but the node repulsion flavor. And to me, it seems that the separability is not very good. It's much more like the one on the left, which has the worst energy model. The one that I really like here is the one on the right, which has also the right energy model, but it has edge repulsion. So it seems very well to me that edge repulsion is critical in obtaining a good separability. But why? I don't know. So I tried to crack the puzzle. Um, NOAC doesn't really come with an explanation. I don't really know either. I have ideas. But what I can say here, from an STS perspective in some ways, is that because we don't have a compelling narrative about that, it's disappeared, as if it made no difference. And people are really convinced on, by the paper on the other argument, which is compelling. But if you actually tinker with the algorithm, you're going to realize that edge repulsion is absolutely critical and that the energy model is in some ways secondary. And so here we might say that the way papers are written, the way the argument is built, it has a huge influence on the way algorithm designers communicate on their algorithms and following that, the way we understand what they produce. OK, so what can we do? Um, so I want here to help the case of situatedness, but I, I, I don't know. I have nothing precise to, to tell people because these, these practices are so entangled in situations where people are doing network analysis in time constrained situations, sometimes lacking a proper training. And that's how it is. And I'm not going to change the, these things, right? So how can I help? Um, other than just talking about it by tools. How would you intervene or interfere with this state of things as a toolmaker? Which, taking the word from Anne-Marie Moll, I would call care, but it, we could also say interfere. Um, so the way I want to do that is to re-dramatize the work of the layout. So what I want to do is to give the map makers something simple to say about what happens in the picture so that it can travel. And my goal here was from start, that's also what I, what I put in the thesis, to have a simple statement, but because it has to be uh, an immutable mobile in the latter sense. It has to, to, to be there to be easily, to easily circulate. Complicated explanation cannot circulate that easily, and so it's an issue for them to travel to the final reader of the map. So there are simpler statements than this one, but they are wrong. So this one is relatively true. That's why I settled on that. And the statement is, at the core, most connected nodes are very close. As you know, not all connected nodes can be close because we have to sacrifice certain edges to get separability. So I would like to say all connected nodes are close, but we know it's, it's not the case. So most connected nodes are very close. And I'm going to make it more specific and more precise so that it's more informative. So the most is going to get quantified into a percentage, and the very close is going to become a distance that I'm going to draw within the map so that it, it travels with it. I call that distance delta max. So the result is what you see here on the left is still the same network, C elegance. And as you can see, the, the distance has been drawn on the map as a scale, basically, but also as a grid, so that you have a sense of what materially represents that distance. And then you have a statement that's below that says that 76% of connected nodes are delta max or closer. And this represents one of the aspects of this placement of nodes. And that aspect is well aligned uh, with what force driven algorithms do. But actually, in no way it depends on how the placement was produced. It just depends on where nodes are in practice. You could also do that with a manual placement of the nodes. So the way I find it is. I pick a distance here on the right represented as this 
uh, red, uh, green, sorry, circle. And then each distance captures a number of edges. Um, that I draw them in, in red, no, in green, sorry. I'm Daltonian today, uh, color blend. Uh, okay, so it captures the, the smaller edges that are in green and the longer ones are in red. And of course, depending on the size of that distance, you capture more or less of the edges, but I count how much you capture in addition to what you would have anyway if the network were rewired at random. So basically, there is an expectation you have. Uh, intuitively, if you have a big enough distance, you expect to capture everyone anyways. So it's not, it's not really interesting. And if it's small enough, you will capture no, no edge. And it's not interesting either. But in the middle, there is a sweet spot where you capture an optimal, a maximal amount of unexpected edges, and the distance is as small as possible. So that metric that I use to find the distance is called connected closeness, and the distance itself is just uh, the, the maximal distance of connected closeness. It's a little bit complicated. Let's just call that delta max. What only matters is that it's drawn on the picture. And so my idea here is that you could have that, for instance, in a tool, and when people produce a network map, the statement is produced with it, and then it goes with it. And what's important here is that even if you know nothing about the network map when you read it, if that statement is here, well, you can have an idea of what has made a difference. It's about the proximity of connecting nodes and what you expected to get from it is that if some nodes are closed, they are, uh, if, the node that connect, see, if some nodes are connected, they will tend to be closed, but that's not an absolute rule. And of course, depending on the kind of network you have, on the kind of placement you have, it may or may not work. But I can show you other cases than this one if you want to later on. Okay, this is my conclusion now. I just want to say that uh, we cannot see into the complexity uh, as if it were simple, contrary to what other kinds of scientific instruments like the, tel the telescope do. So with a telescope, you can look at the moon and the mediation you have of the moon is very intuitive. You don't see the dark side of the moon because it's like a ball in front of you. You wouldn't see the dark side of the ball either, right? But that's not how these tools who deal with complex networks work. And they can't work like that because they embed a reduction. So they can't be used as a complement to reductionist strategies because they are already reductions uh, by themselves. So because of that, we have to think otherwise of the instruments that allow us uh, studying complexity. And my idea here is that we have to multiply the, the views to, f to have different ways of producing the information to fight against each other. You have to get a landscape of, of reductions so that you can counteract the, the problem of reductionism. So that's why I say that we cannot hope to have a complexoscope, but maybe we can have a complexoscope. Thank you for your attention.